This episode is sponsored by CuriosityStream, which now comes free with Nebula. Details are in the description box below. Hello and welcome history buffs, my name is Nick Hodges, and here is part 2 of my Bohemian Rhapsody review. Thank you all so much for your patience, and I hope you enjoy. So despite what happens in the movie when Freddy went to Munich to work on his album Mr. Bad Guy, he wasn't completely isolated by Paul Prenter, who we see block all his phone calls from his friends and work colleagues. Even though the other members of Queen were taking a break, everyone still kept in touch. I was on the album actually. Um, you know, we, we were sort of fully supporting him. Um, but every time I go to Munich, he say, come out and sing some backing vocals or something. Dear. I go to Munich and there'd be no further on. It would be exactly the same as it was a month before. It was terrible and it was just wasn't going anywhere. Now it is true that Freddie struggled with the album. He spent two years on it before it was released in April 1985. For the first time he had full creative freedom but there was something missing and that was his bandmates. Truth was the arguments, the egos, the competitiveness, all of it may have been exhausting but that's often when the magic happens. With Mr. Bad Guy, Freddie did everything alone but without anyone to challenge him or inspire him, it was hard to stay motivated. It also didn't help with Paul Prenter's constant distractions. Well, where is he? Is he there? I want to speak to him. He is working himself to the bone. I'm blue in the face trying to get him to take a break. As I said before, Prenter didn't block Freddy's phone calls in Munich, but this doesn't really bother me as this is clearly inspired by something else he did, which is arguably even worse and may have contributed to Queen losing their foothold in America in 1984. When we toured America, that last time, as it turned out to be the last time, he was the guy who answered the phone. So radio stations would phone up and he would be the intermediary, you know. And he was telling everybody that Freddie wasn't interested, you know. Freddie says fuck off or whatever, you know, which really wasn't true most of the time, as far as I know. <laughs> but, you know, we know now because that's, that information has come back to us, you know. So basically, um, this one person who was a sort of personal assistant managed to piss off the whole of America. Later on in the movie, we see Mary Austin fly all the way to Munich to confront Freddie and find out what is going on. So far, I've been unable to confirm if she did visit, but her boyfriend at the time, Joe Burt, was Freddie's bass player on the album, so it's possible. In any case, she tells Freddie that Paul Prenter has kept Live Aid from him. This enormous charity concert for the Ethiopian famine and every major band in the world is coming. In real life, Prenter didn't need to keep Freddie in the dark about Live Aid because he didn't want to do it. But before you say anything, neither did the rest to Queen. There were a lot of rock bands that didn't take Live Aid seriously or even think it could be done. Anyway, Mary's visit is the right kick up the arse Freddy's character needs and he fires Paul Prenter on the spot. Sorry mate. Just like that. After everything we've been through. Just think of the photos I have. Fortunately, this is one scene in Bohemian Rhapsody that isn't too far from the truth. Freddie did eventually fire Paul Prenter, but this didn't happen before Live Aid, but a year later in 1986. The reason was because Freddie gave Paul the keys to his London home and some money to spend over the Christmas holiday. In typical fashion, Prenter threw a party and trashed the place. When Freddie fired him, Prenter threatened he was going to sell his story to the press, and a few months later, he did. In the movie, we see Prenter do this through a TV interview, where he goes into detail about Freddie's personal life, saying that he slept with hundreds of men and had epic coke binges. It was the ultimate betrayal, but this didn't happen through a TV interview. Instead, Prenter sold a story to the Sun newspaper for just £32,000, and they ran a series of articles. One was called All the Queen's Men, with pictures from Prenter's private collection. We do see this article make a brief appearance in Bohemian Rhapsody when Freddie's father reads the newspaper, something that Freddie had always dreaded, given that his family were religious, but that scene happened in 1980 instead of 1987. Anyway, after Prenter's betrayal, Freddie calls their manager Jim Beach about wanting to get the quote-unquote band back together again, and that he even wants to do Live Aid. The rest of Queen turn up, angry at Freddie, but agree to set their grievances aside. On the subject of Live Aid, Jim Beach insists that they need to make a decision soon if they'll be attending. Bob Geldof. I called to convince him to squeeze you guys into the lineup for the Live Aid concert, but he wants an answer now. 
You convinced Bob Geldof to squeeze Queen in? Are you joking, mate? For those of you who don't know who Bob Geldof is, he was the main organizer behind Live Aid. As the lead singer of a band called the Boomtown Rats, he was able to use his link to the music world to put the concert together. But the fact that Live Aid even happened at all is nothing short of a miracle. It was plagued with problems right from the start, and he and his crew were winging it every step of the way. Just four weeks from launching, he held a press conference naming the biggest bands of the world were coming, but hardly any of them confirmed or even been contacted and Jim Beach was furious when Queen were announced. I suddenly got yanked out, it was Jim Beach Style calling from New Zealand Sting. and he said what the hell is this all about? He said why are you announcing Queen? I said because Bob told me they were doing it and he said what? <laughs> so I kind of I said look we're right in the middle of the press conference he said you better not announce Queen I, said, I coughed a bit and said because he'd already done it. Lying through his teeth, Bob Geldof used two tactics to get bands to come. One was through guilt shaming. Like if anyone complained they were announced without agreeing, he would just say, fine, pull out. I let the press know you didn't want to help the starving kids in Africa. Or he would say, but you do know that so-and-so are coming. The best way is to make them feel threatened by their peers. So it gets to the point, if you're not on it, well then, who are you in the hierarchy? So if you've got Paul McCartney, Mick Jagger, David Bowie, Bob Dylan. Who the fuck are you that you're not doing it? Trust me, Bob Geldof needed no convincing to squeeze in Queen. It was the other way around. He was begging Jim Beach to get Freddie to come because he was especially not keen. I said, oh, for Christ's sake, you know, I mean, you know, what's wrong with him? And he said, well, you know, I mean, he's very sensitive. <laughs> and, uh, and, I said, and, I, and I said, you know, like, I mean, tell the old that it's going to be the biggest thing that ever, what's it, you know, happened and that it's going to be like, you know, this huge mega thing. And um, so they got back and said, OK, we're definitely doing it. The main reason why Queen were hesitant about going is because unlike their other gigs, they weren't going to be the main attraction. The audience they'd be playing to could have been there to see any of the other major bands coming, which is understandable, but the movie didn't think this was a big enough reason, so they threw this into the mix. We haven't played together in years. It's kind of suicide to play again for the first time in front of millions. Try over 1.5 billion. As I said before, Queen didn't break up before Live Aid. They just took a year off, and by August 1983, they started the next album, The Works, which was very successful. That was the one with the two big hits, I Want to Break Free and Radio Gaga. Then in August 1984, they went on tour for nine months, playing all over the world. The biggest gig was Brazil, where they performed to 300,000 people, and they finished just two months before Live Aid. That's why the whole, let's get the band back together again cliche is ridiculous. No band could take a break for years and expect to play perfectly. If you want a good example why that is, just take a look at Led Zeppelin when they reunited for Live Aid. Unrehearsed and out of practice, they sucked so much they didn't put it on the Live Aid DVD. Even The Who reunited for Live Aid and struggled, mainly from technical issues. But it was enough for Pete Townsend to say it was the worst performance they ever did. The fact these filmmakers used this cliche in a biopic and expect us to believe that Queen smashed her live after just a few days of rehearsals? I'm surprised they didn't throw in an 80s montage while they're at it. Following Queen's decision to reunite for Live Aid, we see Freddie watching the news coverage of the AIDS epidemic. The number of people dying from the new disease was growing daily, especially within the gay community. Even Freddie knew friends and lovers who had it, and like we see in the film, he was reluctant to get tested initially, fearing the results would only bring a death sentence. Now, it's not exactly clear when Freddie took his first HIV test. Some speculate that it was in late 1985 when he was first tested negative, and that his second round was in 1987 where he was tested positive. Positive. To be honest though, I don't think it really matters. When Freddy did finally learn he had AIDS, he kept it a secret from friends and family for the longest time. In the movie, however, they bring up the symptoms he suffered in later life earlier than he actually did. By 1985, there was no real indication that Freddy was sick. His incessant coughing we see him struggle with before Live Aid was diagnosed as a throat infection, which he had many of in his career. But it could just as easily have been AIDS related. Could I have a second? Yeah, what's up? I've got it. Got what? 
AIDS. But right now, it's between us, all right? Just us. So please, if any of you fuss about it or frown about it, or worst of all, if you bore me with your sympathy, that's just seconds wasted. Seconds that could be used making music, which is all I want to do with the time I have left. I'm going to be what I was born to be, a performer. This is a very touching scene and very authentic. If Freddy had known he was sick before Live Aid, he still would have gone through with it. So I don't see anything wrong with the film changing it so he did. When the big day finally came on July 13th, 1985, Queen were more than a little nervous. For the first time in over a decade, they're gonna be playing out of their comfort zone. They were scheduled to start at 6.40 p.m. in daylight hours, something they hadn't done in years. And like every other band, they only had 18 minutes to impress an audience that wasn't even there just to see them. There'd be no smoke bomb, no pyrotechnics, no light shows, and most importantly, no sound checks. In the movie, we see Jim Beach check out the systems and cheekily raise the limiters, so Queen would be the loudest band. Now, this did happen, but obviously it wasn't Jim Beach. No manager or lawyer would dare touch a sound system in case they screwed up. Instead, it was their sound engineer, Trip Califf, who was to blame. There was also another reason why Queen was so nervous that you're not going to see in this movie. Just a year earlier, they played at the Sun City Resort in South Africa, and very quickly, they became pariahs in the rock community. There was all sorts of hoo-ha going on, you know, you mustn't play Sun City because it's, um, because it's a sign that you're supporting apartheid. Well, it's simply not true. If you adopted a policy of never playing in a country where you don't approve of the politicians, there would really be very few places you can play. So this really didn't help their image, and just before Live Aid, there were many articles saying how hypocritical it was for Queen to do an African benefit concert given their recent African history. So there was going to be a lot of angry people in that crowd, and the pressure was on to win them back. In the moments leading up to Showtime, Live Aid was suffering from one major hurdle that is accurately depicted in the movie. Despite six hours of epic playtime and 1.6 billion people watching, only one and a half million pounds have been raised. There's not enough money coming in and all these people are not playing for the good of their health, they're playing for the good of other people's health. So get your money out now and phone up and give us the money. You've got plenty of it, or if you've got none of it, get it to people who are dying of starvation. The truth was not enough appeals were going out. The whole thing was being covered like it was just another rock show. So when Bob Geldof headed to the BBC box to remind people to donate, that was when Queen walked on stage. And sometime later, in the corridors of Wembley Stadium, Geldof paused for a moment and listened to the crowd outside going wild. <laughs> To say Queen's performance that day was anything less than spectacular would be an understatement. They were with the creme de la creme of the music world and they bested them all. They weren't playing to their audience, but they knew all their songs. They weren't playing headline slot, but that ended up working in their favor. After several hours of constant play, people were growing fatigued and Queen was their needed shot in the arm. Queen stole the show, there's no two ways about it. The only thing slightly exaggerated though is that there wasn't a huge surge of donations during Queen's gig. That all came after. The one million pounds we see pledged in the movie was made by one guy from the Dubai ruling family. However, right after Queen's set, that was when Bob Geldof sat in front of the cameras and gave the entire country a bollocking for not donating enough. You know, you've gotta get on the phone and take the money out of your pocket. Don't go to the pub tonight, please stay in and give us the money. There are people dying now, let's, so give me the money. And here's the numbers. We let's read go about, the way. No, we're probably going to get the address just, first, aren't we? No, let's fuck the address. Let's get the numbers. <laughs> because that's how we're going to get it. Now, swearing these days isn't as big a deal, but back then, it was almost scandalous. Yet that was the moment that shocked the nation to action, and £50 million was raised. Plus, everyone thought it was hilarious that the BBC, who were very strict about these things, couldn't do anything about it in this case, because it was all for a good cause. Speaking of good causes, I would just like to say thank you to Nebula for sponsoring this episode. Unfortunately, it's harder these days for educational creators to make the kind of content you'd like to watch. Due to advertiser-friendly policies, it feels like we're 
were constantly walking on eggshells, whether it be discussing the Second World War or the risque lifestyle of Freddie Mercury. Fortunately, there is a streaming service where my fellow creators and I are free to talk about anything we want, without the fear of being demonetized, and it's called Nebula. Nebula is a streaming service made by creators where we release content early, ad-free, and even show exclusive Nebula originals that you can't find anywhere else. And any videos of mine that need to be heavily edited or go missing will have no problem be uploaded to Nebula, the way they were meant to be seen. And what's more is that Nebula comes free with Curiosity Stream, which is a subscription streaming service that has nothing on it but documentaries, including history, and you can get them both for just 26% off the annual plan. That's less than $15 for an entire year of content. So give it a try, there's tons of stuff to watch, and you'll be supporting many educational creators. To get started, just go to curiositystream.com forward slash history buffs. Although Queen's performance at Live Aid wasn't the end of their story, it's not a bad way to end their movie. The band had been a record to say it was the greatest day of their lives. Before Live Aid, they were close to breaking up. They had just been on tour for a grueling nine months, and since they had been so successful for so long, they were losing that incentive to keep going. Live Aid changed all that, and is generally seen as the peak of their careers. So when it comes to storytelling, it does wrap things up rather nicely. Having said that, is this the Queen movie that I've always wanted to see? Unfortunately, no. That doesn't mean I didn't enjoy it, but I felt it had more to do with the fact that it had Queen music in it. If you take that out, and the story was about another band, I don't think people have enjoyed it so much. For me, the issue is that the filmmakers played it way too safe and didn't take any risks. Also, for a film that's supposed to be a love letter to Freddie Mercury, it sure has a funny way of showing it. There always seems to be these little jabs at his character for one reason or another. Like, how come he's the only one who's ever late for anything? Hello. You're late. Am I? What does that even mean, not strong? No, I'm late. What did I miss? We're going to see you. We've got an hour left. Wait, no, what about this no, one? I think we're still late. It's a good sign. Screw it. <laughs> What's going on? You'd know if you're on time. I'm a performer, darling, not a Swiss train conductor. So sorry, my darling. Lost all track. Except for that one time when they're late to the end of the movie, but that's just to teach him a lesson. Where are they? They're late. Now, I'm not saying Freddy was never late, but so what? Sometimes the other guys were too. In Mark Blake's book, Is This the Real Life? The Untold Story of Queen, the producer, Reinhold Mack, remembered when Freddy came up with the song, Crazy Little Thing Called Love, and Freddy said to Mack, if you're up for it, I've got an idea, but let's do it now before Brian arrives. Now that is irony. Obviously, no one's perfect. Even John Deacon has some stories. Like the time he walked out of recording an album to go on holiday. You never knew quite what was coming next from John. I mean, we did find a note going to his guitar one day. Uh, it just said, gone to Bali. Christ, if the uh, four-letter word has gone to, to Bali, I go skiing. But what about that scene where the filmmakers make Freddy go hat in hand to apologize for breaking up the band, which is something we know he never did? I've been hideous. I know that, and... I deserve your fury. I've been conceited, selfish, but an asshole, basically. Strong beginning. Look, I'm happy to strip off my shirt and flagellate myself before you. Or I, I could ask you a simple question. I'm good with the flagellation. And let's not forget all the wisecracks these guys make about Freddy's appearance. What about me? Uh, not with those teeth, mate. <laughs> I've got to make an impression, darling. You look like an angry lizard. <laughs> it's your best work. Very subtle. You're gonna fly away. Wow, the way these characters are written makes it look like they weren't even that close, doesn't it? Freddy, we're a family. No, we're not! But you don't really hang out with them or anything, do no. you? No. I mean, do you think that this whole business of bands saying, oh, we all love each other and we all hang out with each other and we're all really best friends and all that? That's a load of trash. Yeah. I hate socializing with the band because, I mean, you see them, I see them all the time and I'm, we've been together about 12 years and I'm sick to death of looking at their faces. <laughs> and so, I mean, we, when we come together, we, you know, we do it for, for musical reasons and for, for business reasons. It's, it's a job. 
you know, if I like them, I'll socialize with them now and again, you know, it depends, but I mean, as a rule, I don't. Okay, so what about Freddie Mercury himself? Did the actor Rami Malek pull him off? Well, I think he did a good job with the material he was given. I mean, he got his singing down, he got his mannerisms down, but he just doesn't feel very Freddie to me. And I think it all comes down to the writing. I mean, the fact that they made a PG-13 movie about the guy says a lot. I mean, we're talking about someone who used to get backstage blowjobs in between songs to freshen up. Do you have hobbies? I have not done. Yeah, a lot of sex. Hmm. Try and get out of that one. I just think that by centering the man, you take away something of the man. I remember the very last gig in Nebworth. Freddie said, look, I can't fucking do this anymore. Um, you have to bleep me again, won't you? <laughs> it's very hard to quote Freddie without swearing. <laughs> it was just part of his vocabulary, you know. Everyone to get fucked all night, every day, just like I do. <laughs> Fuck everybody else. It's not just the swearing that's missing, he was also a very funny guy. And there wasn't a moment in the movie that made me crack up quite like the way the real Freddie does. Fred, how do you feel uh, playing and singing before 200,000 people? I haven't done it yet. <laughs> We're thrilled to be with you and look forward to a great and sparkling future under the uh, Disneyland or should I say Hollywood sign? Good luck, okay. Hollywood. Bye. Bye. Maybe once more. <laughs> oh shit, all that no, crap no. again? <laughs> anyway, I'm sure there'll be some of you in the comments section who loved Bohemian Rhapsody. And that's fine, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I just felt the movie played it way too safe for my taste. Personally, I would have loved it if they made a, a Wolf of Wall Street style movie that wasn't afraid to show the wild side of Freddie Mercury. Because apart from his music, that's what made him so interesting. And I have a feeling that's the kind of film Freddie would have liked too. I went to see Freddie and it was in fact the last time that I saw him. He said to me, I haven't given you anything in my will. You're my executor. You can do anything with my legacy. You can do anything with my music, but never make me boring. So before I wrap things up, I'm gonna share four of my favorite stories about Mr. Mercury that you won't find boring. That did make the cut in the movie for one reason or another. Such as the time Freddie took Princess Diana out clubbing. Apparently one night in 1988, Freddie, Diana and Kenny Everett were drunk and watching reruns of the Golden Girls. After finding out their plans for the night, Diana asked if she could join. At first Everett tried to dissuade her, seeing how she was royalty and the press would have a field day if they caught her. But then Freddie said, oh for goodness sake why not, let the girl have some fun. So to disguise one of the most recognizable women in the world, they dressed her up in drag, with a jacket, a cap and dark sunglasses. Then they headed off to a gay bar called the Royal Vauxhall Tavern in South London. Despite their poor disguise, it only seemed to work as they melted into the crowd and nobody had the slightest idea that they were reaching for the lasers with the People's Princess. Another story is when Freddy almost got into a fight with Sid Vicious from the Sex Pistols. Back in 1977, Queen were recording their sixth album, News of the World, and it just so happened that the Sex Pistols were recording at the same studio they were. Now the story varies on who's telling it, but apparently Sid Vicious drunkenly stumbled into the control room and confronted Freddie Mercury. Sid came in, and Sid was a moron, you know, he was an idiot. That's a spell holiday. S-H-I-T. I think Sid actually spoke first and said, of course you're Freddie Mercury, aren't you? You're, you're, you're bringing ballet to the masses, right? I called Sid Vicious and I called him Simon Ferocious or something, and he didn't like it at all. I said, what are you going to do about it? You know? And he had all these very well, sort of, he was very well marked, you know, so I said, did you really, you know, make sure you scratch yourself in the mirror properly today and uh, tomorrow you're going to get something else? He hated the fact that I could even speak like that. Right. Then, um, so we went... I think we survived that test. There's also the story of how Freddie almost did three songs with Michael Jackson. In the early 80s, the King of Pop was a huge fan of Queen. Seeing their shows regularly at the LA Forum, Michael proposed the idea to Freddie of recording some songs together. They got on well, except for the fact that I suddenly got a call from Freddie uh, saying, Miami dear, can you get on over here because you've got to get me out of this studio. I said, well, what is the problem? He said, I'm recording with a llama. He said, Michael's bringing his pet llama into the studio every day and I'm really not used to recording with a llama and I've had enough and I want to get out. It also didn't help that Michael Jackson, who disapproved of drugs, busted Freddie doing cocaine in his living room. They grew apart shortly after. I think one of the tracks would have been on uh, the Thriller album if I'd finished it. But um, I missed out. 
Now, as for this last story, it's a little heavy at the beginning, but trust me, it pays off. It takes place in 1991, in the last few weeks of Freddie Mercury's life, before he died from AIDS. As we all know, his final years were a particularly harrowing time for Freddie, not just from the disease, but because he was hounded day and night by the press, who all fixated on the fact that he wouldn't just admit that he was sick, and none of his friends or family would either. Any respect for privacy was out of the question to the press, seeing how Freddie Mercury was a public figure, and this is alluded to in the movie during the press conference scene. Of course, this scene is in 1982, which was still the early days of the epidemic, but some of the questions are based on actual quotes from later interviews. In your song, Life is Real, what do you mean by the line, love is a roulette wheel? Are you implying that the more partners you have, the more chances you have of contracting something? What? Freddie, concerning your private life, there's lots of pictures of you in the tabloids looking drunk or ill. But which one is it, ill or drunk? I had a cold last week, if anyone cares. But like I said, this only alludes to the kind of grief Freddie got. The truth is much darker, that saw some really disgusting articles published, not just trying to figure out whether he had AIDS, but how long he had left to live, based on his past lovers dying and his trips to the hospital. The thing that annoyed me more than anything was a shot of Freddie in the sun. And he just come out of the doctors, I think, and it was really grainy, full page shot. Is this man dying? I thought you fucking wankers. But there was at least one moment in his final days that brought him some comfort. Around this time, a comedy was being shot in America called Wayne's World, and its main star and writer, Mike Myers, had been a longtime fan of Queen. And there was one song of theirs in particular he wanted to feature in his movie. I think we'll go with a little Bohemian Rhapsody, gentlemen. Good call. This was a scene where Wayne, Garth, and their friends would cruise through streets of Aurora, Illinois and blast out Bohemian Rhapsody and sing along to the words, something that Mike Myers and his brother used to do in Toronto when they were kids. When the scene finished filming, Mike Myers phoned up Brian May to get Queen's blessing and sent him a tape. Brian then took the tape around to Freddie's house and although Freddie was very ill and confined to bed, he was still alert. Freddie watched the tape and absolutely loved it. He couldn't stop laughing. That scene was very close to Freddie's sense of humour and even captured a moment in their youth, as Brian May recalls. It's great hearing your own tracks on the radio, you know, but if it happened like we're in the, the Winnebago on tour or something and it came on the radio, we would all be like sort of headbanging to it, you know, and just sort of enjoying the moment. So I, I guess um, Wayne's World were closer to the mark than even they realised. Freddie thought it was a great little tape and gave it a seal of approval, and then a few weeks later, he died. Wayne's World released in February 1992 and became a box office hit. That scene brought Queen back into the American consciousness, and for the first time in 17 years, Bohemian Rhapsody was in the US charts and peaked at number two. Mike Myers, the man who helped make it happen, was then given a little scene of his own to play the fictional character of Ray Foster. Well, that's the kind of song teenagers can crank up the volume in their car and bang their heads to. Bohemian Rhapsody will never be that song. Well, that about wraps it up. My name is Nick Hodges, and thanks for watching, History Buffs. And remember, if you like the show, help the channel grow. If you wish to support History Buffs, then you can now do so at Patreon. And as always, let me know in the comments section what you thought about Bohemian Rhapsody. And of course, what historical movie should I review next? In the meantime, check out the History Buffs Twitter and Facebook pages for new updates. Until then, I'll see you next time.